All right, I'm back with uh, another video um, regarding the Fisher CA-880 integrated amplifier. I had previously made a series of four videos um, uh, that were really quite unintended. Um, I had purchased this amplifier along with its matching tuner and cassette deck from eBay and uh, the seller uh, alleged that everything was in working order and when I unboxed uh, the amplifier, I haven't looked at the tuner or cassette deck yes, yet, but when I unboxed the amplifier it looked nice but it didn't, it, it had a problem in that one channel was intermittent. Uh, uh, it would go from not working at all to working with distortion. And in the previous, so what I'd hoped for initially is to pull this amp out of the box, turn it on, it would work, and I would begin essentially where I'm beginning now, which is a, a brief description of the amplifier and some basic testing. Some basic testing to ensure that it works, uh, to check the condition of the power supply capacitors just based on listening uh, for hum and and noise and uh, checking all the potentiometers for scratch and that sort of thing. Anyway, it didn't work and I had it go through a repair process of repairing the tape monitor switch. And the tape monitor switch turned out to be faulty. And that would be the switch right there that no longer works because I had to harden, oops, sorry, I bumped the tripod. I had to hardwire the switch internally to bypass the tape loop, which I don't care about. I don't uh, want it. I don't need it right now. And the switch itself, the parts are probably not readily available. And I didn't want to uh, spend make a career out of this thing trying to find the switch and fixing it and that sort of thing. I just want the amp to work as a basic integrated amp. So that's complete now, and the amp is working. And what I what I hope to do in this uh, video or series of videos is, is to to do some electrical tests, some listening tests, and hook this up to my Bose 901s, and uh, give it a listen. And, and with that, I will get out my good microphone to give you a full uh, full frequency um, experience of what this amp sounds like through the Bose 901s. And I might try this through a couple of different speakers <coughs> that I have on hand. Just uh, a variety of different speakers. I don't have any super uh, uh, audio, super great audiophile speakers on hand. My audiophile days are over. That was years ago when I had uh, extraordinarily expensive gear. And long story short on that, I used to think that I would find some kind of audio nirvana with really expensive gear, and it turned out not to be the case. It was real neat and gee whiz and all that and a lot of money spent, but I found that through the years I came to appreciate the inexpensive equipment uh, probably even more. I, I find it to be a little more charming and, and definitely more accessible, but it's just fun to tinker with it. When you buy expensive gear, you don't want to mess with it. You know, you, you just want to leave it there and listen to it. And Anyway, those days are, 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 are over with. I kind of like tinkering and cleaning and restoring and... and, and I kind of like the time machine aspect of, uh, of uh, buying something from, you know, this, this particular amp we're looking at was probably manufactured and or sold in the early 80s. Um, I'm, I'm almost positive of that. So, you know, it's kind of like going back in time and, 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 you know, the same as any similar hobby of collecting antiques or vintage uh, anything. Uh, um, and... One thing about this amp that I really like is I like the looks of it. I think it looks really nice. Um, it looks, I love VU meters, as I mentioned in my previous series of videos, and this has them. And I especially like the uh, the blue uh, the blue kind of look, of the, the blue the blue lights, uh, the the backdrop. And I'm going to turn the lights out here and uh, and show you what this amp looks like. And by the way, I I have cleaned it. Um, it turns out that uh, I, I had re 
rebuilt the amplifier previously. Uh, uh, they all rebuilt it. I had taken it apart to repair it, and I put it back together, and I realized that on the inside of the glass base plate here, where the VU meters are, was uh, was dirty. It had some something in there, droplets of something, and uh, don't know where they came from. Maybe I did it myself, and when I had the face plate off before, I'm not sure. So I took the face plate off again, and um, I cleaned the inside of uh, the glass. And what I use, I don't know if you can see this or not, what I like using for that, you can't. This this is uh, some kind of plastic. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what type of plastic, but it's a hard plastic, and you really don't want to use uh, paper towels or anything that scratches, and you know, a microfiber, not even not even a cotton towel. You want to use a microfiber cloth to clean that. And what I like using, let me see if, it, if I can get this on the camera, is uh, is this stuff here um, called uh, Magic Fiber, and it is sold for lenses and camera equipment, and uh, and it. It, it's good at getting up lint and dust, and, and um, it does not scratch plastic at all, which is important. There are f a few fine scratches on the plastic from uh, probably its previous owner who, who maybe wiped it with something like paper towels or, or even cotton, but you can't really see them. So I've cleaned it up. It looks nice. Uh, let me take this off the tripod here, get a look at it. Turn the lights off in a minute. <clears throat> um, it has music going through it now. Uh, the music that I have playing is not playing through speakers because I don't want any copyright violations that are going to cause this video to be muted. Um, so what I have is I have my source is uh, Sonos. Um, um, right now I'm streaming Spotify. I don't even know the song that's on something. Um, and uh, I have the speakers hooked up to my dummy loads. And these are my 8 ohm dummy loads. I even forget. Uh, these are power resistors. And uh, oh, I even forget. Uh, oh, they're 100 watts. They're 100 watt 8 ohm power resistors. Uh, let me see if they're getting warm yet. Not even warm. Not much power. And I'm also looking at the signal through the oscilloscope. It looks like we're between songs now. Um, let's see. Get something on here. Okay. So something should be playing in a minute. I apologize. Couldn't seem to get a signal through my Sonos, but now we have it. So um, let me turn it up a little bit, and you can see both VUs are uh, indicating power on both channels, and uh, and they're pretty. Uh, this is okay. I'm going to turn it on right now. See, I'm on stereo, and this music has a lot of differentiation between the channels, and I'm going to push mono right now to uh, just so both channels are the, are the same. And <clears throat> here's my music. Um, and both channels are, uh, the, the, the O scope is set for, um, a two volts per division, um, on both channels, and I have one channel hooked to, uh, left, uh, dummy load, and the other hooked to the right dummy load. Um, when you do this, make sure that, um, uh, your, my, my probes are set to one times, um, both of them. Um, for the attenuation and uh, and uh, these making sure that uh, these these uh, connections are going to the negative both of them are going to the negative uh, outputs the speaker jacks of the amp and uh, these are positive you don't want to mix up polarities when you put this on a nose scope so we're looking at the music and on, let me turn it all the way down and um, as indicated by the O scope uh, there seems to be little to no noise um, when there's no signal, and that's a good thing. I'm going to listen to through speakers in a minute for any uh, audible hum or buzz. But right now, I don't see much noise. Let me turn one. Now, right now, I have the volume all the way down, and I'll turn 
sensitive uh, sensitivity of one channel bring that down some bear with me a second Okay, sorry about that. Um, just had to tinker around with the scope. Both channels are uh, set to 20, um, 20 millivolts uh, per division, and there's no signal right now, so you're just looking at the noise. And uh, that noise can be generated uh, not only by the amp, but through uh, external, external factors. Um, uh, maybe a, a noise from the fluorescent lights in the room and that sort of thing. But it's very little noise right there, so... Uh, you're looking at, uh, for example, looking at the, the yellow trace. Um, at 20 millivolts per division, uh, that noise is, uh, the RMS uh, of that noise, just by looking at it, is, is uh, less than 10 millivolts. And, and that's very low. That's a very low signal, and, and that's good. Let's expand out. Um, the time a little bit, and you can see, you can see a uh, semblance of a of a sine wave in there, sort of. Um, um, but it's on both channels, and that's just typical uh, um, typical noise from the power supply. Um, nothing unusual there. Nothing didn't get a problem. Both channels are about the same, which is good. That means that they're both functioning equivalently, um, and that's a positive thing. So let me go back to the music signal real quick. Let me hit pause and get that set up. Okay, we're we're back to um, a music signal uh, playing in mono, and we're back to two millivolts per division. So everything looks good. Um, and what I'm going to do uh, in a little bit is uh, figure out what the uh, maximum power this amplifier can deliver, just based on uh, um, crank, uh, putting in a sine wave and turning it up until the sine wave clips. Maybe we'll look at the frequency spectrum too. And finding out right before clipping what that peak um, peak voltage is and then uh, convert it into RMS and see if it, if it uh, is equivalent to the specifications. Um, but first get a close-up of the amp it, it looks very uh, but I did clean it and there 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 uh, was and still is um, some oxidation or oils I'm not sure what around some of the uh, most frequently used switches like such as the power switch and that's typical but I got most of it off but I didn't want to over clean it and run the risk of um, wiping off any of the um, any of the any of the printing um, any of the lithography uh, on here and I didn't want to do that because it looks so nice so it was just a very gentle cleaning and and the glass looks nice and what I'm going to do now is I want to turn off the lights and show you how how nice it looks Let me put this on the tripod uh, how nice it looks in 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 the dark all right well that may be too dark <laughs> but uh, let me get a close-up of those of those VU meters and you can see below there's a, uh, also a peak indicator, uh, a red LED. There's no r way to turn that off by, by, by switch, but it, I don't mind that. Um, it's probably a little too dark, but if it's hard to tell, those, those um, VU meters have a nice uh, glow to them. Turn one light on. There we go. Um, so I like it, and it looks nice. And I can't wait to hook it up to some speakers. Mm, there's the music. So the first thing I want to do is um, hook... Well, actually, the first thing I want to do uh, is take a pause and just briefly describe the circuitry of the amp for anyone interested. A, bit, a fundamental overview of... of um, of the signal path. I won't take too long doing that, but it is of interest. And once I do that, then we'll start some of the basic testing. 
um, such as I don't think I'll do a THD measurement on here. Uh, I think I'll I'll just look at the at, at the uh, Fourier transform and with uh, by putting a fundamental uh, sine wave in there and just seeing what its components are. Um, I don't think I'll run a full THD test on this. It's just not necessary. Um, but we'll do the maximum power. Uh, test because I'm very curious to see how how um, the amp compares with its specifications. But I'm going to hit pause now and then uh, go over the signal path of the amplifier with a brief description. There's one interesting part of the signal path um, that I really didn't. That kind of surprised me. I don't. It probably shouldn't have, but um, but that's here and there. I'll cover that in a minute. Um, and then start doing some testing and then conclude with some listening tests with my better microphone instead of using the built-in mic on the my ancient first generation HD camcorder here um, <clears throat> but it still works alright let me hit pause for a second and then I'll get out the schematics and we'll briefly cover the signal path okay just just to start with uh, looking at the spec sheet from the service manual, uh, we can see that uh, the, the power, I have to get it close to read that, the continuous RMS sine wave power per channel uh, uh, is 100 watts. The power bandwidth is 40 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Power bandwidth is actually more important and actually a better indicator of frequency response than just plain frequency response. Um, many amplifiers that have a claimed frequency response, let's say of you know 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, the typical thing, um, <clears throat> uh, that's not necessarily a power bandwidth because it, it, because uh, that's with a small signal in, uh, input. Uh, and you know the amplifier might be capable of delivering uh, a small amount of power from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz but when you actually turn it up to peak power or the peak rated power um, that will change um, so at peak rated power all kinds of weird things happen and uh, uh, or begin to happen and so power bandwidth is telling us that hey this at, at full power at 100 watts per channel this amp is capable of, of uh, producing <coughs> frequencies of 40 hertz to 20 kilohertz usually that's specified as plus or minus uh, 3 dB it doesn't give us um, a tolerance here but so but anyway that's perfectly fine um, no problem there total harmonic distortion at peak power is rated to be 0 0.09 percent which is perfectly fine THD is not a good indicator of, uh, of sound quality at, at whatsoever. Um, anything, you know, you really can't hear much below 0.1%. And I challenge you, even at 1% THD, some tube amplifiers sound fantastic versus some uh, solid state amplifiers that have ridiculously low ratings like 0.0001% will sound terrible. There are many other factors involved in, in, uh, in reproducing sound than, than other than uh, total harmonic distortion. Um, so, but anyway, 0.09 is, you know, that's tip, typical and perfectly fine. Um, no problem there. It's, you know, it's a decent transistor design. Um, and intermodulation, IM distortion, 0.09%, same thing, no, no biggie. And the rest of these specs just go into uh, uh, what the tone controls do and that sort of thing um, and the power required and that sort of thing so anyway I want to verify that 100 watts at some point and and also just do a quick a quick uh, scan of uh, just to verify uh, the frequency response I don't care about power bandwidth I'm just going to do it with a small signal uh, just to get an idea of uh, whether this thing can reproduce uh, the full spectrum of let's say 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz without significant attenuation um, plus or minus 3 dB let's say um, okay so specs now 
I had previously marked uh, this block diagram, and I'll, it's, so it's kind of hard to see, but I'll, I'm going to go over it very briefly. This is uh, an indicator of, of the design of the amp, uh, and let's just follow uh, uh, the signal path, one signal path, and I'm going to use the auxiliary because that's what I'm, in, that's what I'm using to input my signal. Um, so, begins with the, uh, the phono jacks, the auxiliary, the jacks in the rear, and we plug our signal in. And it goes through uh, the function switch uh, that selects between uh, the phono uh, that, went, that went through a phono preamplifier or the tuner, uh, which is the other input. Um, and then we go through uh, the tape monitor loop right here, which I have uh, bypassed, so this is irrelevant. Then we go through a mixing, I'm sorry, a mixing amp, and uh, this is that that amplifier that it allows you to mix a microphone input with uh, with another source signal, um, and I'm will never be using that, so that switch is off and that's effectively bypassed. Um, followed by the balance pot, uh, uh, and followed by the volume and the loudness. Uh, contour switch I'm not going to be using but that's integrated into the um, the volume uh, circuit followed by a preamp and I'll get in, I'm going to show you what that looks like in a minute uh, followed by the, the main power uh, amplifier which in its feedback loop has the tone control circuitry uh, out from the power is the uh, the uh, speaker fuses this is not the mains power fuse that's internal. These are actually speaker fuses that are on the back panel uh, of the amp that are accessible uh, to the user if the user blows them. Um, and then following the fuse is the hookup to the VU meters as well as the, L the, the uh, LED peak indicators. Um, and then of course to the speakers themselves. So, what's what I'm interested in is the preamp circuitry and the power amp circuitry, and I'm going to do just very brief, not too much detail, but just do a brief overview of uh, what those circuitries uh, look like. And uh, the preamp, let me see if I can find that here. Okay, <clears throat> so looking at the schematic, move my glasses here. Um, and we're not going to get into detail about this, but all of this stuff over to the left is uh, these are the switches. This is the uh, phono uh, RIAA equalization. Then we get into the mic mixing. And at the very top here, not to get into detail, we have our balance pots and we have our volume potentiometer with our uh, with our uh, I, okay. So. Here are the balance potenti potentiometers or potentiometer, and then here is the volume potentiometer, and this stuff right in here is the loudness contour circuitry, um, and uh, I'm not going to be using that. And then what follows after that is the preamp, and this is the preamp, and this is not discrete circuitry, but rather this is an integrated circuit in the form of uh, an NJM 4558, and that is an op. It's a dual op amp. It's got two built-in operational amplifiers. It is. Uh, it's designed for audio. It's a high-quality uh, audio grade op amp, and that's going to provide us with our uh, initial pre-amplification or, or or our voltage gain that will in turn feed the power amplifier and this is the power amp now the power amp begins with typical uh, differential amps and uh, followed by some buffering and voltage uh, some current gain here and then the output of the power amplifier are these integrated circuits but they're not really integrated circuits in the true sense they're Darlington pair 
ICs, integrated circuits, and it's not a full integrated circuit like an op amp or like some of these really cheap uh, complete audio amplifiers on a chip things. These are these are just a convenient way to get uh, what they call Darlington pair output, which are the main output uh, transistors on most class AB uh, amplifiers of this design. And instead of just having th uh, four or so discrete transistors, they put them all into one chip and uh, with internal connections and um, um, and they're all in, in built into one chip so they can be conveniently uh, uh, attached to the heat sink in one piece instead of having uh, you know eight transistors or, or more individually attached to a heat sink you just need one thing one a chip per channel attached to the heat sink but it's not really a true IC like uh, like you know, a full uh, a full audio amplifier that would encompass all of this circuitry, and maybe even in addition to some of the preamp stuff. Uh, so I consider this a discrete output design. Um, and then so anyway, output uh, when you when the out uh, when you take the output from the uh, the Darlington pair chips, it then goes into the tone control circuitry, which is right here, which is fed back to one side of the initial differential amplifier so the one the preamp signal comes into one side of the diff amp and the feedback from the tone control comes uh, to the other side um, so the tone control is in the feedback loop uh, and uh, and that's it I mean uh, out from that you know we go to the meters and the LEDs but that's so in essence uh, let me hang on, pause for a second. I might want to find something else in my paperwork here. Oh yeah, so I just mentioned the power amp uh, ICs, the Darlington pair ICs, and I wanted to find the equivalent circuit, and that's that's it right there. Uh, th these are Dar that's a Darlington pair. They're just uh, they're just two transistors connected, um, emitter to base, emitter to base, and that it multiplies the gain. Uh, basically, the gain of one multiplied by the gain of the second. It's, it's, it's a way to increase the current gain, not the voltage gain, but the current gain to supply that that final oomph of current you need to 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 to, to drive speakers. So you know, basically, audio amplifiers, uh, power amplifiers, you know, do two things. Uh, you have a signal in, and there's two uh, two fundamental stages. The first is a voltage amplifier. Um, you need to take that little signal and you need to increase the voltage. But voltage amplifiers are, are, are not designed to output immense amounts of currents, you know, on the order of amperes sometimes that you need to drive speakers. So then you have to take that voltage and you have to have, you have to put it through a current amplifier. The current amplifier does not increase the voltage at all, but but allows that voltage to be passed through a very small load. 8 ohm is a very small load, you know, or 4 ohm or, or what have you. And that's going to require a lot of current. So basically the current amplifier uh, buffers this voltage amp and, and facilitates taking that same voltage that comes out of the voltage amp and allowing that voltage to, uh, to pass across the speaker uh, load, which is a small load, and also supply the necessary current that's going to be required. Um, so that's just very brief, off the cuff kind of explanation. That's why they call it a power amplifier because um, voltage multiplied by current, um, V times I equals power. Um, so anyway, you know. So individually, a voltage amplifier usually can't supply very much current, and a current amplifier doesn't amplify the voltage. But together, uh, collectively, one followed by the other, um, you get a power amp, and that's what we have here. And so usually, the preamplifier is responsible for some of this voltage gain, and so the preamplifier is responsible for some if not all of the voltage gain and then we go uh, into the power amp where there's usually this differential amplifier that's usually a noise reduction technique um, and followed by some voltage gain followed by the current uh, amplification or, or, uh, factor with and these Darlington pairs 
that are on the IC. Um, these things can supply a lot of current. That's why that that's the thing that's hooked up to the heat sink. Okay, so enough of enough of the details of the design. Uh, what I'd like to do now is. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, for anyone interested, I did uh, look up that that preamplifier IC chip because I wasn't really familiar with that one. I'm familiar with op amps and how they work, but um, so here's the preamp that uh, preamplifier integrated circuit, and there's the description of it. It's just a high quality audio op amp, um, and here is the internal uh, schematic of how it works and just basically a differential there's our differential amp and again that's a way to increase voltage gain and also cancel common noise that appears on both uh, inputs the uh, you know any noise introduced into a wire uh, into a, a couple of wires that are close to each other such as the the ground wire and the signal wire will be on both wires right so um, that common noise will will go into one side of um, of the diff amp and it will also go into the other side and what a differential amp does by its very name differential meaning difference is it only amplifies the difference between uh, the two inputs so the signal of course will be different you know the, on ground you'll have ground but on the plus you'll have the signal so that's a difference that'll get amplified but any common noise that was introduced into both lines will get canceled out by the diff amp and the diff amp provides a little bit of voltage gain. Um, and then uh, followed by some typical, uh, uh, there's some gain in the circuitry. That's just boring stuff. Um, uh, the signal, this stuff provides a little bit of gain and also provides uh, a nice low output uh, impedance. Um, and enough of that. So we have covered the basic design and now it would be a good time to start some of the some of the tests I want to do very fundamental tests. nothing sophisticated on this um, I've been running it now for over an hour I just it's the first time uh, I've run it for this long and I was I, I intentionally did that because I wanted to see uh, I wanted to see if uh, how hot the heat sink would would get just based on Outputting, you know, roughly about five watts, maybe, continuously for over an hour, and I can tell you that the heat sink is just moderately warm, just a little bit warmer than room temperature. So nothing, and both heat sinks are uh, the equivalent temperature. So nothing uh, terribly unusual going on there. That's a good thing. Another thing I like to do uh, after running an amp an unknown amp for a while is smell, you know, listen, smell things. Um, it might sound funny, but when certain electronic components begin to go bad or, or are bad, they smell uh, uh, like, oftentimes like burnt popcorn, you know, or there are other smells, but they're very, very, like a burnt rubber smell sometimes. They're very distinct smells. I smell nothing. I see nothing. I hear nothing. That's a good sign. Um, uh, the next test I want to do is I'm going to hook the amp to uh, a sine wave generator and try to max it out uh, looking at the oscilloscope and to find, I'm going to do one channel at a time, and to find uh, what the peak voltage will be uh, before clipping you know before the amp just absolutely flat out gives up and you can see clipping very clearly on an oscilloscope um, yeah, it's where the where you have this beautiful sine wave and then the peaks suddenly just have a cliff on them you know this boom they flatten out uh, transistor amps clip hard I mean they reach that point and boom they clip tube amps don't clip hard they they have soft clipping uh, because they have such enormous headroom in terms of voltage you know the power supplies are often 400 600 800 volts so the tubes don't just flat out uh, clip uh, out of nowhere they usually start to the peaks of the sine waves start to slowly slowly get oval shaped instead of that nice round shape 
um, first. So transistors are easy to recognize clipping. So we're going to do that. I'm going to hit pause now and try to get that that kit set up, and, and we'll take a look at it and figure out if, if it's true that this amp can produce um, 100 watts a channel continuously into 8 ohms. And then we'll tinker with some frequency response, maybe a couple other things. And then finally the listening test, which probably is the most important. All the stuff I'm doing might not even, probably isn't necessary, I'm just curious. What matters is listening to it. And and we'll do that coming up shortly. <clears throat> okay, back to the testing. Um, <clears throat> I was just tinkering around here a little bit. The first thing I noted, uh, I noticed, is that the VU meters are not properly calibrated for an 8 ohm load. The power is specified as a, um, being 100 watts continuous. Um, power into 8 ohms and I would think as such the VU meters would be calibrated for an 8 ohm load but they are not. Uh, just to give you an example let me pull this off the tripod so what I have now is the um, on the O-scope, I'm just looking at one channel because both channels are behaving identically. So just to avoid confusion, I'm going to look at one channel. I have a frequency set of uh, roughly one kilohertz. That uh, doesn't that doesn't matter, but one kilohertz is a good standard for measuring for calibrating things um, because it's it's in sort of in the middle of the frequency spectrum and it's not going to be affected by low frequency or high frequency attenuation or anything like that. So. Um, so we have one kilohertz, and I have the volume knob set to input the sine wave to display roughly two watts. If, I don't know if you can see that, but that's two watts, 2.0 watts right there, and I'm adjusting the volume knob. So we come over to the O-scope, and um, I'm looking at channel one, and I see that I have an RMS voltage of 2.523 and I know that I have an 8 ohm load those are my dummy resistors so um, we can uh, take uh, 2 um, point 0.5 times, I'm just going to do this very rudimentary uh, to show you how I'm doing it, 2.5 times 2 0.5, so that's uh, voltage squared, V squared divided by our 8 ohm load will give us roughly 0 0.7, 0 0.8 watts, about 1 watt, okay, um, whereas we're indicating 2. So let's crank this up to 10 watts as indicated, and I see that now uh, on channel 1 I now have 5.59, uh, 5.6 volts RMS. So we go um, 5.6 times 5.6 equals uh, divided by our 8 ohm load 3.92 watts. Um, so that's a little bit off. Um, it doesn't matter so much. These VU meters are not intended to be scientific instruments. They're just intended to show you that you have sort of a music sense. It'll give you a rough idea where you stand. Um, but they're calibrated to make you think you're using more power uh, than you are. And uh, but again, they're not. You know, these aren't meant to be scientific grade. They're both indicating the same, by the way. Even though I'm looking at one channel, and both channels behave identically. It would be interesting. Maybe I'll. Uh, you know, what I might do is put, try to put one channel into a four ohm load and see if this is more calibrated to four ohms. But it doesn't matter. I don't care. They're working. Now, let's go ahead and uh, take our one kilohertz sine wave, and I'm going to crank this up to the point where we can see clipping. Boom, do you see it? I don't want to keep it there too long because that'll start to overheat my 
So these are 100 watt resistors, but I don't want to stress the amp or overheat the resistors. But what I'm going to do is uh, watch for the clipping. See right there, boom, on the top. It starts to clip. Okay. So right where it starts to clip, I have 29.23. So 29.2 volts RMS. 29.2 times 29.2 divided by our 8 ohm load gives us 106 watts. So it is true that this amp is capable of delivering 102 or 100 watts as, as specified. VU meter is not so accurate. They could probably be recalibrated with a resistor. Uh, I don't care. Um, I'm almost glad they read higher than what actually is because I want to see them moving around at low signal levels. You know what I mean? So, no biggie. Now, let's see where the peak level indicator lands when I actually get to clipping. So, right now at the peak level being the LEDs down here. So right now I'm at 3 and I'm at indicating 2 watts, 10 watts. So it, it seems to go to number not 5, the LEDs, when we're well prior to clipping. And you can see I'm going to turn it up to number 5, the highest LED. And we're not even close to clipping. Look, there's, there's clipping. So, you know, I, I don't know what purpose that thing has other than gee whiz there's lights blinking um, and and by the way you know the average consumer buying this thing wouldn't give a shit anyway this is just geek stuff I guess you call it you know well, what's going on here and why does it do what it does and that sort of thing so but we we have verified that we can produce a 100 watts into an 8 ohm load and that is at fully accurate um, so let's go ahead and I'm going to pick a power, I'm going to say roughly 10 watts, and I'm going to start playing with frequencies just to see what happens. Uh, you know, uh, just to see if we can start to see any attenuation. So I'm going to go low. I'm going to start going lower, okay? I'm at 78 hertz right now. The lowest I can go in this setting is 135 hertz. So I'm going, that's 135 hertz on up to 2 kilohertz. And you can see there's no attenuation. I'm not, don't worry about the frequency. Attenuation, you're looking for this to go down, right? And there's nothing there. By the way, all tone controls are flat. Loudness is off. Balance is middle. That doesn't matter. Okay, so let's change my settings so I can go super low. I'm, I'm going to go between 13 hertz and 225 hertz. I'm going to start with 225, 225 hertz. Put in our 10 watts again and let's see what kind of attenuation we get on the low end if we're really capable of uh, achieving 20 hertz without attenuation although it's rated at 40 hertz. So I'm at 225 hertz right now. I'm starting to go low. Okay, I'm at 13 hertz right now. So that's at 13 hertz. And I have uh, an RMS of 5.7. And I'm going to go all the way up to 225 hertz. And I have an RMS of 5.5. So that's roughly the same. So there's no, uh, this thing is going down to 13 hertz without any low frequency attenuation. Okay, I'm not doing the power bandwidth because I'm not doing this at full power and I don't even want to. So, this is, goes well below, you know, this amp produces frequencies well below 20 hertz, it's down to 13 and I'll, I'll see if I can, let's go see if I can, this oscilloscope is cheap and it doesn't, I'm going to see if I can go down to, one. okay, now I'm at 1.3 hertz. <laughs> Look at what the VUs do at 1.3 hertz. <laughs> They're working. 
Um, uh, so at, at 1.3 hertz, um, the RMSs are all over the place, but it, it looks like 10 volts. And by the way, some of this could, well, I really can't get a feel because, you know, the VU meters are all over the place. Let's go, let's start out at, so you can see, okay, I'm at 10 hertz, and you can kind of see the signal. Let me lower this a little bit, okay. And then I'm going to start going up from there, and you'll see the signal. Okay, now we're at uh, 3 hertz, right? Okay, let's, you'll start to see a rise in amplitude, I hope. Okay, now it's starting to rise in amplitude. Well, not much. Now we're at 22 hertz, and we have 16 volts RMS, and then back down to th 2 hertz. We have 9 volts RMS, back up to 22 hertz, 15 volts. So this amplifier goes low. No problemo, right? I mean, really. So let's... Let's go to the high end of the spectrum. Okay, I'm at 22 kilohertz right now. Let me see how far. Okay, I can. I'm going to start out at around 10, roughly, you know, somewhere close to 10 kilohertz. Let's get a signal here. Okay. Hold on a second, I messed up. Yeah, I'm at 10 kilohertz. All right. I'm going to look at, I got both channels back, but let me get rid of uh, channel 2. And then bring back channel 1, bring her into the middle. Let's do some measuring. So channel 1. Um, okay. Let me see if I can get a frequency readout on channel one. I think this O scope, I don't use, I haven't used this O scope a whole lot, and I don't remember. Frequency, okay. 9.5 kilohertz. And you can see there's our RMS 2.45. So let's start out, we're at 9 kilohertz, and I'm going to roll this up to start getting closer to 20 kilohertz, okay? No attenuation, no attenuation. I'm at 22 kilohertz. So at 22 kilohertz, we have an RMS of 2.3. And at 9 kilohertz, RMS of 2.4. So this thing goes above and beyond 20 kilohertz. Let's see if... I'll go to 100. Okay, there's 100 kilohertz. Damn. The amp is producing uh, something at 224K. Okay, so I'm going to start rolling back down towards the audio band. And now, see, boom, you can see the amplitude increasing as we get close to the audio band. Now we're at 98 kilohertz. See, that's where it's flat right there. It's starting to stay flat. It's starting to roll off right there. It's rolling off at 70 kilohertz. Okay. Um, okay. Now we're down to 60, 50, 40. There's our 15 kilohertz. Okay. That's 15K. No, it's 21K. 15, 21K, 29. So it's starting to go down. So it, the amp has no problem with uh, low and high frequency uh, reproduction. It's just giving you a rough idea, but no problem at all. So it is, it is a 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz amp. Now, when you get to peak power, if, I don't know who listens to it that loud. Um, um, although, driving those bows, it may, it may get that loud because bows 901s take a lot of power. They are power hogs big time. Um, so there we have it. I mean, I'm very happy with the, uh, the performance of the amp. It's doing well, and by the way, it I've been running it. Let's go ahead and take it up to. I'm at 13k. Let me get down to a lower frequency of about one, somewhere in the range of 1k, and just turn it up. Just 
turn it up to okay there was our clipping okay I'm right below clipping I'm gonna turn it down a little bit more and we're indicating 50 watts we know that's a lie let's figure out what we got here we have 15.3 volts RMS I'm just gonna say 15 times 15 divided by 8 28 watts 30 watts okay uh, even though it's indicating a little less than 50 but it's actually indicating 20, 30, it's indicating 40 watts, and we're getting 30 watts, so, and I'm just going to feel the heat sinks, and they are hot, oh yeah, heat sinks are, are, are hot, I probably couldn't, it's almost at the point where I can't keep my hand on it for more than 10 seconds, my loads are hot, my dummy loads are hot too, so, it's, It's doing its job. No, nothing's blowing or you know shutting down. The heat sinks are doing their job. So I think this amp is ready to hook to some speakers. Um, now let's you know what let's toy with let's toy with the loudness real quick. You want to see what the loudness does? Um, let's try it at the let's let's take the loudness in and out, and we'll do it at mid mid range frequencies, low and highs, and just to see what's going on. Let me start out with uh, one kilohertz, which is Roughly one kilohertz, which is a mid-range uh, frequency. And let me go with let me go with three. Uh, three shouldn't be that affected by loudness. All right, let me uh, go with uh, indication of twenty watts. Okay, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna kind of blend all those together because I don't care what the about the frequencies. I care about what happens to the amplitude so loudness is off loudness is on off on very little effect at three kilohertz right let's try high frequencies like 15 kilohertz okay here's ah, what am I doing I may mess that up. I want to go to my 1K setting. Let me try that again. 2.26 kilohertz. Let me try that again. I think I messed something up. Okay, 2.26 kilohertz. And a loudness off, loudness on, off. That was good. Now let's let's go high to like 15k. Okay, loudness is off, loudness on. Look at that. Loudness off. Okay, loudness off, loudness on. So it increases the high frequencies uh, significantly. Okay, loudness off, on, off. Now let's look at what a loudness switch does to the low frequencies, and I'd like to go down to, um, let's say, 50 hertz or so. Okay, 50 hertz. Okay, there's our 50 hertz. Loudness off, loudness on. Huge, holy cow, look at that. Off the charts. Let me take the voltage down real low so we can see it. So, loudness off. Loudness on, okay, loudness on, loudness off. So, you know, that's what the loudness does. It increases the low frequencies and the high frequencies. Um, I find loudness to be horrendous, and uh, I never use it. But that's what it does. It's like turning your bass up and your treble up, sort of. Um, okay, that's loudness, and uh, there's nothing else I really want to measure on this thing, really, I mean, just want to start listening, but everything looks good. You know what, one more thing I want to try, I'm going to hit pause, and just get a quick look at the frequency spectrum, the Fourier. Okay, so I thought 
it might be fun to just look at the frequency spectrum and uh, determine how this thing distorts and and uh, <clears throat> and where the dis how the distortion correlates with the uh, the 100 watts. You know what what's happening right prior to 100 watts and what you know what the uh, harmonics. Uh, which harmonics are being produced during the distortion process. <clears throat> so, um, first of all, I pulled out my better quality. Uh, th this is a cheap oscilloscope, and the measurements on here are, you know, have to be taken with a grain of salt in the sense that they're not extraordinarily accurate. They're accurate enough, but um, this is a really super cheap oscilloscope, so I don't trust it as well as I do my uh, digital voltage meter here, which I'm going to go ahead and measure. Once again, the RMS voltage at one kilo, one kilohertz when the uh, amp clips. So I'm going to crank it up to clipping. There's clipping. There's right before clipping. Or right before clipping, roughly 30 volts, almost what we, almost what the um, oscilloscope measured. So let's see in the frequency domain what's happening. All right, so we are in the frequency domain, and what you are seeing um, is the fundamental frequency <clears throat> is one kilohertz, and that's this big peak right here. Let me change a setting on here. Okay, now I'm at one kilohertz per division. So each division is one kilohertz. So we're looking at, uh, we have a fundamental sine wave, that sine wave that I just showed you. That one kilohertz sine wave is the, the level, the voltage of that. And this is in the, on the d decibel scale, dB scale, it's relative. But this stuff down here is essentially noise. Uh, it's really low in amplitude. Um, uh, again, this is a dB scale, so uh, uh, in the dB scale, these these things down here are way, way, way lower than actually the peak up here. I won't get into decibels, but, <clears throat> but, uh, so this is our one kilohertz sine wave, and this is the relative amplitude of it right now. You can see if I'm going to, I'm going to control the volume knob, and I'm turning the volume down. Now the volume was all the way down, and uh, ignore this line over here. That's just uh, an artifact of, of uh, DC, of, n of nothingness, essentially. So we're looking at noise, okay? So I'm going to turn the volume up to our 20, okay? And that's what we see. So I'm going to go down to 0. I'm going to go up to 20. And we're starting to see some of the uh, harmonics. Now, this is really, really super low. This is uh, under 1% uh, THD. But we're starting to see our our odd harmonics pop up. So this is our one kilohertz. We're getting a harmonic. We're getting a little harmonic at two, a bigger one at three, nothing at four, bigger one at five, and again at around seven kilohertz. These are odd harmonics. Uh, just uh, additional sine waves that are added to the fundamental uh, sine wave uh, through the amplification process. That it is in, it, in essence is a result of distortion. But again, this is super low. Um, not a problem. I want to show you what happens at clipping. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to crank it up to clipping. I don't want to keep it there that long. And so I'm going to crank it up to clipping and look at what happens right there. See, boom, all of a sudden you start to get uh, you start to get all these harmonics popping up uh, super high in level. Um, let, me turn, let me turn the voltage down and do that again. Okay, we're at we're at we're at zero now. Okay, I'm gonna start turning the volume up, and you can see our one kilohertz rising. Um, and now I'm gonna go to clipping again, right somewhere around here. Boom! There's clipping, and all of a sudden, all these harmonics pop up. Right. So where is that? Where is that happening? Where these harmonics start popping up? So I'm gonna I'm gonna go right to clipping, where the harmonics start popping up. Right there, and it starts at 31 31 volts. So right about the same, you know, as we expected when we started to to, to actually see the clipping. Uh, so that's about the same. So really, 
um, as I turn the voltage up, um, I'm at, I'll tell you where I'm at, I'm at, okay, right here I'm at 0.5. Okay. I'm at 0.5, uh, well, you know, let's go with volts, okay, because we know that the maximum voltage that we put out is about 30 volts before clipping. So we're at 1.3 volts here. And I'm going to start to turn the volume up. You can see the volume starts to rise. Okay, our our uh, our fundamental starts to rise, but meanwhile the harmonics stay about the same. I'm now at six volts, indicated as ten watts, probably closer to five. And we're going to keep going up. I'm turning the volume knob up. I'm now at eleven volts, still no uh, no rise in harmonics. I'm now at fifteen volts, no rise in harmonics. Now there we go to eight. 18 volts we start to see a little something jumping and that's where we hit the 50 watt mark okay let me go to 26 volts so still about the same and 31 volts boom and I turn it down right where I can turn it between the two it's about 29 volts so let me turn this down so the amplifier distortion wise looks pretty good um, I could measure this again at different frequencies and see how that changes, but I'm not going to. Um, and again, as I mentioned last time, the key is listening, and that's what I'm going to do next. So I'm going to call this video uh, one part in a series, uh, this part being the bench testing, and the next part will be hooking the amp up to some speakers. So I'm going to wrap this up. I'll go ahead and publish this video, and then maybe tomorrow or the next day I'll get around to hooking the amp up to some speakers, and we'll do some listening, and I'll have my good microphone so you can hear better what I'm hearing. And we'll try a couple different speakers, uh, ending up with the Bose 901s, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how this amp at 100 watts is able to drive the Bose 901s. I think the Bose 901s need more than 100 watts to do justice because they are very power-hungry as in my experience um, and there's reasons for that it's based on how the Bose equalizer works really um, base frequencies require tremendous amounts of current and the, and the Bose equal, equalizer uh, really really uh, increases the base gain significantly um, the Bose, Bose produce wonderful bass I like the bass I don't care what anyone says it, it sounds good everything's it, it you know it's not going to be as, as tight and, and well-defined as, as an audiophile would like, but from just general listening, it, it's, I, I, I like the way the Bose speakers produce sound. I was going to say I like the way they distort, because every speaker distorts, but I just I like the balance of them, and it's just overall a really good listening experience for any kind of music. I like them. So we'll end up with those. I'm going to call it a day, wrap this up, go ahead and publish this video, and uh, um, and go on to the listening test next. Thanks for watching for those handful of folks that appreciate this. I n normally, I've been tinkering around with electronics just for fun for years, you know, by myself. You know, I don't know anyone else that's into this hobby, but over the last several years I've decided to make a couple of videos unscripted just as I go along thought somebody would get something out of it um, and um, that's what I'm continuing to do here um, and again I've picked this particular project because I purchased as I mentioned before matching amp tuner and ca cassette deck just for nostalgic purposes and because I like the look and I'm hoping that this thing will sound pretty good too and I'm sure it will um, I have I have heard them through my my bench speakers my Panasonic thrusters up there, um, uh, and you know these these are. Uh, I'm a fan of full range speakers, and these obviously are cheap as you know cheap as hell. Uh, this is the this is low budget gear, but I just I just like I just like them. Um, and I use them just for bench testing things. Uh, they they can't really produce deep bass, so I have no idea how that's going to work. I also use these uh, Sony speakers uh, that came off a big old boombox occasionally to bench test things. Uh, but the real test awaits. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.